Amen. You may be seated, and kids, third grade and under, can go to kids' church. Third grade and under. If you notice these teal color shirts from the kids, they just got back from kids' camp, those that were able to go and had a good time. Leah, would you turn up the lights, honey? Thank you. We have lots of great things happening. As Pastor Sean said, we have a, a hopefully a short, just informational meeting after the service, kind of on our findings of the special committee that you appointed to look at different Wesley Arminian denominations. And uh, so we'll, we'll have that meeting after the service. But come back uh, around 5 tonight, bring a, a potluck dish, and enjoy a Christian concert and fellowship. This event is meant to just bring you together and, uh, and worship the Lord. If, if you're a woman and you want to get more involved in women's ministry, there's a, a cookout at Sherry Collins' house tomorrow. Um, a pool, you can bring your grandkids. I think that's what the slide said. That may be dangerous if Eileen brings all her grandkids. Uh, but, uh, but go and, and be a part of that. Lots of good things happening, guys. And uh, God is really blessing us in this season. It's nice to, to be busy in July. And then in 29th of, of this month, we're going to be at Granville Park. And so it's a, we're going to have a, a boat race the kids are making. We're going to have a, a kind of a voting contest on the best dessert. And um, more information coming to you guys on that. But uh, look forward to that. That's a, that's a good thing for our church. It's in the community. It's a great time to invite friends and family, neighbors, coworkers, and say, hey, we got this church event. Come join us. And uh, look forward to that. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Samuel chapter 23. Just to catch you up to speed, God anointed a nothing, nobody shepherd boy to be the next king of Israel. And he defeated Goliath, the Philistine champion. Because when he looked at Goliath, he just saw a bear or a lion that was attacking his sheep. And he said, I got this. The Lord's help, I can do anything. So he's been elevated uh, into being uh, a prince in the palace as he meet, marries the king's daughter. He's in charge of a thousand men. He becomes best friends with the king's son. Everything seems fine and dandy except King Saul, who's the first king of Israel, gets jealous of David, tries to kill him multiple times, and David has to flee for his life, living in caves. Yeah, we all want God to anoint us for great things, but we don't want David's full journey, do we? I think most of us would like to just cut out this section. After Goliath, and then when he becomes actually king, that would be better, right? But that's not how his story goes, and that's typically not how our story goes either. And so we're going to see that God has great things planned for us, even when our life isn't working the way we expect it to. And So while David's hiding out with a group of people, who are kind of the rejects in society. They're men that have problems and, and issues and debt. They come and find David in the cave. And, and over time, Scripture tells us that these guys become David's mighty men of valor. At this point, they're not. David gets news of this small town in his tribe named Keilah that's being attacked by the Philistines. And he goes to God and says, what do I do? Am I called to rescue them? And God says, go. And then David goes to his men and says, hey, God's calling us to this. And they go, we can't do that. we got enough trouble in our backyard. We're not going to take on an army. Saul's definitely going to hear about this. This isn't a good idea. So what does David do? Does he listen to God or does he listen to his men? Well, he goes back to God, brings these questions and concerns, and says, God says, go. I'm going to provide the victory. So they deliver the city of Keilah. And after they do so, Saul finds out and decides, I'm going to put this city under siege. So David once again goes to God, says, what do I do? Do I leave? Do I go? Will the people betray me and turn me into Saul? And God says, Saul will come and the people will betray you. And We talked about how, you know, that kind of stirs anger inside of us, right? If you lay down your life to rescue somebody else, you'd expect them to be willing to do the same for you. But we saw that these are not David's sheep. They're Saul's sheep that he rescued. And so he has to give them back to God. And it's not about us. It's never about us. It's about the calling. And people are worth the sacrifice. People are worth the risk. And so David leaves Keilah, and Saul doesn't attack Keilah. And we talked about because that city wasn't wiped out, what kind of prophets 
what kind of future generations came from that town because of David's gracious attitude toward them? And, and somebody in this room may be a descendant of someone from that city great long ago. We just don't know. And, uh, and so we have to keep that perspective. Well, we're, we're picking up in 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 13. Through, uh, we're going to read through verse 18. But I, I don't want us to overlook these chapters. And I'll tell you, as, as a pastor writing sermons, you know, it's much easier to write the, the good, happy, uplifting, um, easy messages, right? The ones that everybody wants to hear. And, uh, but that's not what we're called to do because it's so often that the greatest growth happens in our most challenging moments. And we'll see that this morning. So David and his men, about 600 of them now, left Keilah and began roaming the countryside. Word soon reached Saul that David had escaped, so he didn't go to the Keilah after all. Now David stayed in the strongholds of the wilderness and the hill country of Ziph. Saul hunted him day after day, but God didn't let Saul find him. One day near Horsh, David received the news that Saul was on the way to Ziph to search for him and kill him. Jonathan went to find David and encouraged him to stay strong in his faith in God. Don't be afraid, Jonathan reassured him. My father will never find you. You're going to be the king of Israel, and I will be next to you, as my father Saul is well aware. So the two of them renewed their solemn pact before the Lord. Then Jonathan returned home while David stayed at Horish. So we read about these specific places in this passage, and they don't mean anything to us. I mean, Ziph, Horish, like, okay, whatever. We don't live in Israel. We are not from the tribe of Judah. Uh, So let me try to give you a proper context here. David, having been a shepherd, would have known the Judean countryside very well because Judah is not like West Virginia. We're almost like a tropical rainforest here, right? There, you have to go long distances to find food and water for your sheep and goats and cattle. So so he would have roamed a fair amount of distance. It's much more rugged land. There's rocks everywhere. If rocks were able to be grown in fields, you'd find a lot in Israel, right? That's, that's, that's what's happening. And so when we think about this, David's background in being a shepherd has prepared him for this moment because he knows every nook and cranny and crick and holler that's out there because he's researched it all in his previous life, in his, in his previous calling. And so as we think about these locations in the tribe of Judah, we've got to think it's a distance of about 35 miles from north to south. So it's like Morgantown to to Clarksburg is about the length of Judea or Judah. And its width is about 15 miles. So when we read about David fleeing Saul and running from his life with 600 men, we've got to realize it's not that big a space. You're not talking about hundreds of miles you're talking about 10, 15, 20 miles. And Saul has utilized his whole army. It says that his thoughts day and night, his focus day and night is on killing David. Wow. Let me remind you. What has David done wrong? That this king, this father-in-law of his, thinks nonstop about his murder. He's done nothing wrong. He's loved the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. He's been faithful to his father-in-law, the king. And yet, this is why David has been anointed the next king. Because David has a self-giving heart. But Saul is disobedient to the Lord. He does what he wants to do. And he has a fearful approach where even his greatest allies becomes his enemy. And so many times, guys, we suffer in life because of our own choices. But this is a scenario where David is suffering because of the placement where God has put him because of Saul's sin. David is suffering because of Saul, but it's not outside of God's calling for David. David is being called up because Saul is this way. And so you, if, if I were David or you were David, you may be like, could you have called someone else? Why me? I was happy and content to take care of sheep. Yes, when there were parties, my dad would forget to invite me or whatever else, but it's better 
than running for my life every day where the most powerful man in my nation wants me dead and is consumed with thoughts of killing me. David cannot give up and quit because this is his calling. This is why he lives. This is why he exists. And for all of Saul's efforts and and obsessive thoughts, he can't find David. You know why? The Scripture says God won't let him. Guys, if you're walking in obedience to God, you don't need to fear your enemies. You don't need to fear them. Do you know why? Because God is your protector. We just sang it. I hear your SOS. I hear your calls for help, and I will protect you. Now, does that mean you'll never have confrontations? No. But that means the confrontations you do have, God allows. And so that that changes your whole perspective. We cannot live in perpetual fear. Now, that doesn't mean that David took nice, long strolls right out in the open for anybody to see. It doesn't mean he, he had render the hearts come to Judea and, and put on a concert and send out flyers. Hey, David's going to... No, he didn't do that. He did have to be wise and all the rest, but he had to keep a heart and an attitude that my God has called me to this, and he's going to protect me. He's going to fulfill that calling. In the same way, God will enable those that will encourage us and stand with us to find us. 600 men found David. And Saul, with his vast army, can't put a finger on him. How does that happen? Three letters, G-O-D. God. And, and all of a sudden, Jonathan's like, you know what? Dad's getting kind of close to David, and I haven't seen David in a while. I'm just going to pick up and find him and go encourage him. It doesn't say that, that Jonathan had a tough road to hoe to find David. He just goes out and finds him. He just goes out. So listen. You know what that tells me? That can encourage you and stand by you. God will make readily available when you need it. When you need it. And I am sure that David grew tired of this ordeal. Because no one wants to be mislabeled. No one wants to be marginalized or run over. And for me, I even think of his underutilization. If I were David, I'd be like, God, You know my heart. You know my giftings. You know my calling. You know my passion. Why am I still hiding out in caves? I want to conquer your foe. I want to stand for truth. Why am I eating bugs? Why am I here? That may be you as well. I just love you, Lord. I just want to serve you. Why am I in this spot right now when I could be doing so much more for you? Oh, what David might not realize or what we often forget is God's glory is most clearly seen in us through conflict as our faith in Him shines through the hardship. The Bible's full of it. You've got the ten plagues of Egypt. You've got the crossing of the Red Sea you got the seven-day worship service around the walls of Jericho. You have Daniel in the lion's den. you got uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in the fiery furnace. I mean, what would the Bible be if it didn't have those moments? What if the Bible just had these flowery, happy moments with no conflict? That the gospel just went out and the emperor gave Paul roses. No! That's not the gospel. That's not what we see in Scripture. It's in these moments when the enemy draws near, when there's conflict, where there's difficulty, that the glory of the Lord shines through and brings transformation. And so why does Jonathan go to David? He knows he's at a tough spot. He knows. He knows his best friend. He knows that as strong as he is in his faith, that there's got to become some dark moments. I mean, listen, if you've been in a dark place for a long time, you know the truth, but you don't feel the truth. Amen to that? You can wonder, where is God? Why is he so distant? And Jonathan obeys God, goes to David and says, listen, I know you're called to be the next king. My dad knows that. Dad will never find you. And I'm going to stand by you when that happens. 
Let's make a vow once again before the Lord in faith. David needed that. There was nobody, because Jonathan was outside of his current situation. Jonathan was from the palace, stepping into a situation. But you know what didn't happen? Jonathan didn't bring his tent with him. Jonathan didn't say, okay, David, I'm going to join you in the cave. You know what Jonathan did? He went back to the palace. That's tough. When sometimes those that are closest to us, that know us best, that are our best encouragers, do encourage us, but they don't stick around. Why didn't he stick around? Well, his calling was to be a voice of reason in his father's ear if he was willing to listen. And have you ever wondered, how did the nation of Israel function while Saul is running around trying to kill David? Who's really leading the people? My bet was it was Jonathan. Jonathan was taking care of the issues. Jonathan was putting out the fires. Jonathan was taking care of the day-to-day, thanklessly. Jonathan is the unsung hero of 1 Samuel. And guys, the world runs on unsung heroes that never get recognized or praised, even though they are capable and willing and available. God loves fruit that grows in the shade. And he delights in it himself. That's who Jonathan is in this passage. Verses 19 through 29. But now the men of Ziph went to Saul and Gibeah and betrayed David to him. We know where David is hiding, they said. He's in the strongholds of Horish on the hill of Hikalah, which is in the southern part of Jeshimon. Come down whenever you're ready, O king, and we will catch him and hand him over to you. Oh, the Lord bless you, Saul said. At last someone is concerned about me. Go and check again to be sure of where he is staying and who has seen him there, for I know that he is very crafty. Discover his hiding places and come back when you're sure Then I'll go with you, and if he's in the area at all, I'll track him down, even if I have to search every hiding place in Judah. So the men of Ziph returned home ahead of Saul. Meanwhile, David and his men had moved into the wilderness of Maon in the Arabah Valley just south of Jeshimon. When David heard that Saul and his men were searching for him, he went even farther into the wilderness to the great rock, and he remained there in the wilderness of Maon. But Saul kept after him in the wilderness. Saul and David were now on opposite sides of a mountain. Just as Saul and his men began to close in on David and his men, an urgent message reached Saul that the Philistines were raiding Israel again. So Saul quit chasing David and returned to the fight the Philistines. Ever since that time, the place where David was camped has been called the Rock of Escape. David then went to live in the strongholds of En Gedi. Now, once again, David is going to be betrayed by men. He's being betrayed by the men of Ziph. And it doesn't seem to make sense on the surface. The men of Ziph are from the tribe of Judah. If anything, they should be on David's side because they are his countrymen. But like Keilah, they don't take up his side. So we're not told their motivation. We can speculate. There's some certain things I can throw out there. Like maybe they just want Saul out of their land and out of their territory. And the best way to get Saul out of Ziph is to give him what he wants, and that's David. Maybe it's just that self-serving. Maybe, though, they really like Saul as king, and they're just loyal to him. Or maybe they're seeking some sort of reward. We're not told their motivation. That's unimportant to the passage. Either way, David once again suffers betrayal from a group of people that you would think would be his supporters, or at the very least, just stay out of the whole situation. That's tough. It's tough when people you trust, or people that you've walked a journey with, or people you would assume would be loyal, betray you. But the Gospels say that Jesus did not entrust his heart to men. He didn't. Even his own disciples, he didn't fully entrust his heart to. He lived for them, he died for them, but he knew they were going to betray him, and yet he still washed their feet. These were life lessons that would make David a better king than Saul was. David had to learn that you have to follow God and not follow people. You have to pursue God whether people like it or not. You've got to choose to do the right thing no matter how you're received. It would be easy after David has been betrayed now a second time for him to get angry and defensive 
and, and let that change his character and become hardened. We've got to fight that, guys. You're going to get hurt in the church. You're going to get hurt in this church from people that you love and trust. Most of the time, it will be unintentional. Sometimes it might be intentional. But you've got to fix your eyes on Jesus and love and pursue him no matter what. What David is learning is that no one should live to attain the approval of other people. Man, it's hard to live to make other people happy. Anybody tried it? Oh, yeah. Parents, stop trying to live to make your kids happy. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Kids are fickle. Adults are fickle. Have you ever tried to make everybody happy all the time? It is absolutely impossible. And if that's been your life, I feel really sorry for you because today you're going to hear freedom, but up until now you've been suffering needlessly. You cannot make people help happy. Everybody without Jesus is self-seeking. Most people are loyal to you as long as it benefits them. And yet in, in the midst of the situation where everybody that should be loyal to David has turned against him, even his own father-in-law, God has sent him a bunch of nobodies and nothings, the rejects of society, who have been in the, in the pit with them, who've been in the cave with them, and they're just as dependent on God as he is, and they become so loyal that they become mighty men of valor. That's what church should be about, guys. It's not a place to network. It's not a place to meet famous or popular people or make a name for yourself. Church is supposed to be a place where we come in here and we say, I'm desperate for Jesus. And we're real and we're raw and we're willing to tell our stories and are willing to hear other people's stories. And together, as we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, he raises us up and we become faithful followers together. Do you think these betrayals are painful to David? Absolutely. I think anybody with a shepherd's heart loves people. And every time that, that a, a, a sheep bites, it hurts, right? But David needs to learn that uh, sheep don't lead a shepherd. We need to learn that. Sheep don't lead a shepherd. And who is our shepherd? Not me. Jesus is our shepherd. We will suffer if we follow people instead of following Jesus. That's where Saul has fallen into a pit. He's trying to make everybody happy. Even in his response, you like me. You really like me. Someone's concerned about me. It's, his balance is crazy, too, because he's trying to make people happy and still do what he wants all the time. It, it, it's crazy. That's why he's paranoid. Even to the point where these guys say, hey, we found David. And he says, great, check again, please. I don't trust you. I just want to make sure. And so Saul comes. David goes deeper into the woods. Saul follows him there. It's this dramatic moment in Scripture. It's easy for us to imagine because we live in the hills of West Virginia, right? Uh, Fourth of July. You can see and, and hear fireworks everywhere. I've always wondered, and, and more recently, about the 4th of July, because that boom is kind of a happy sound on the 4th of July, but what if we were really in war? What the, would that sound mean to us? And so David is fleeing for his life, and he's on one side of, of this hill, and, and Saul's men is on, are on the other side. David's got a force of 600, and they're trying to be quiet and stealthy. Saul's got an army. And can you, I just imagine that David's men can hear Saul's army. Because an army doesn't move quietly. Where are they? It echoes in the hills. What direction is it coming from? And, and it, the scripture gives a, a, a signal that they're coming together. They're, they're both rounding the same hillside and, and they're about to meet up. And a messenger comes to Saul and says, hey, you forgot your day job. The Philistines are attacking. We need the king to do his role. And Saul leaves his attack on David to fight the real enemy. God will not allow anything to stop his good purposes for his people when we're walking in obedience. God will protect us. I'm not saying there won't be struggles and hardships and pains and all the rest. That's part of living in a fallen world. 
But God brings us through that to build our faith. In that moment where they had no hope, God stepped in and delivered them. We are living in a season covenant where we are, it can be very dangerous for us to lose why we exist. Uh, Wednesday night, we've been studying the book of Revelation, and, and this past Wednesday, we looked at Revelation chapter 2 in the church of Ephesus. And the description of Ephesus at the beginning is awesome. It's Jesus addressing the church, and he's saying, you're a really hardworking church. You, you've endured Nobody's changed your heart and life. You pursued me in the middle of hardships and trials. And, and you've, you've found the heretics in your group. And you've weeded them out. And, and all these great things that we would want to describe our church, right? Like everybody wants to be called faithful and, and enduring and hardworking and all the rest. Yes. And he says, there's one thing you're lacking, though. You've forgotten your first love. You've forgotten why you follow me. You've forgotten that passion you had for me at the beginning. So much so that if you don't repent of it, you're going to be removed from my presence. Folks, we as a church have been established this next summer will be 40 years. Amen. Praise be to God. But we have been defensive We've stood strong for biblical truth. We've stood strong in, in the face of a culture that, that is moving away from God's Word. We've, we've stood strong against false teaching and, and sometimes harmful leadership. But we can't miss the point of why we exist. And why we exist is to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself. I want you to join me in prayer for God to give us Leadership with a spiritual gift of evangelism. We need God to raise up individuals in our body that have a hunger and a thirst and a passion in that avenue to lead us to reach our community for Christ because we haven't done it in the last few years like we've done it in the past. Thank God we got, we got this group in Hungary that's doing it. And I'm praying they come back on fire and they set us ablaze. We've got Bethany in Kosovo. It's happening but that's where we got to get back to. we gotta, we got to invite people to church. What a novel idea, right? Family, come be a part of what God's doing here. I, I, I had a conversation with an individual. I was like, my thing as a pastor is I don't want to steal sheep from other churches. That's not in my heart. So many churches grow because they just take sheep from other churches. They take their best leaders, and then they leave that church struggling and they just build a, a huge church to themselves. That's not in me. But this person replied back. He said, well, what about people who are in churches that aren't getting fed and don't have the truth and don't know the word, and we have it here? Should we not invite them? He had a point. But I want us to reach the lost. We're here to make disciples. I want us to be a welcoming church. I want us to be a place where anybody can walk in the doors. But we can't wait for people to walk in the doors. we got to go to them. So like tonight's event is a great opportunity to invite somebody. What's happening on the 29th is a great opportunity to invite somebody. We've got, what, two more nights of VBS? Get your neighbor kids out. Get your grandkids. Get your nephews. Get your nieces. This is life. And I don't know about you, but I want to renew that hunger and passion for the simplicity of of sharing the good news and living it together. I remember when I was dating my wife. I couldn't wait to get off work and drive out and pick her up and walk around downtown. We had, I had no money. I couldn't take her anywhere. I would write her poems. And each poem was numbered. And each poem was numbered by how many days since I had known her. So there was 44, there was 65. Before our wedding day, I had a list of 100 reasons why I was going to keep myself for her until our wedding day, and I posted it above my bed. I had hearts all around my house, numbered, counting down the days until we were married. 
Man, I was in love. I still love my wife. It's pure now than it was then. But I don't do those same things for her that I did then because I've taken it for granted. Because I'm content in what I have. And I, I don't even acknowledge the blessing that I have. That's how we are with Jesus. And we need to get excited again. So, I know it's been a shorter message today. And that's by design. Because I believe that there are Jonathans in the room today sent to our body of Christ to encourage us. This is your chance to testify. And I don't mean to put pressure on anybody. If you're, if you're one of those people like, oh, he's going to ask me to say, I'm not asking any individual to say anything. But if anybody in the room has some encouragement for the body of Christ to say there is hope, there is life, there is joy, God's doing something new, I want to give you the opportunity to share it. So I'm going to come off the platform. Anybody raises their hand and want to share, I'm going to pass the mic to you and uh, we'll continue on that way. Anybody have a word of encouragement? Any Jonathans in the room? Anna. Hey, um, so I was talking to my mom a couple days ago, and we were talking about um, like Cove and Desert Rock, and like how we're all about um, and just kind of like and I was saying to her like it's because you are like you and Dad are friends. My friends, friends, and like you chose to like intentionally have community with each other, um, and like choose to live with each other. So, just for all of you like young parents um, or parents of young kids, like choose to live life with other people, um, and you'll see the fruit of that, and you'll get to be a blessing. Anybody else? I knew I could count on you, Chester. I've been praying uh, at my house almost a month, and they are out by the death. Drive. I've been re- uh, uh, looking through my Bible. My brother got me a whole take Bible tape, and every morning I go outside. And take in all three scriptures and in the Bible, and it's been touching my heart. And but I hear on all the tape I've been praying. Bible a good thing to read. You get to know the Bible. And trust God in your heart. All the people you've been praying for each day in the church. I've been through. I've been praying for all conference for uh, president and people get ready running for president. We need to get all conference back in shape. What we did, you know, good, good, you know, good way now. Got um, our government people up the capital, you know, you know. Every time you turn on TV, radio, someone got killed. Someone saw him. And some way, when God helped, I hope to stop and stuff. You know, I worry about all kids, junior high kids, high school, great kids. You know what will happen sometimes. Someone can walk in the door right now, you know. And uh, we need more talk walk over to our kids. Thank you. Yes. God can bring change, but we don't live in fear, right? That's what the message is, God. He's going to lead us and guide us. Anybody else? No pressure. Just want to give you 
give an opportunity. Uh, my list of Jonathan extends pretty much to everybody in this room, but there were some things that I was really struggling with kid-wise and um, just unanswered questions, you know, not sure what to do. And Rhonda Fowl is my Jonathan. And, boy, I love to watch her worship. It makes me want to worship even more. But I'm just very thankful for her and her uh, praying through with me and, and being there for me. So thank you being the Jonathan in my life. Anybody else? Oh, okay, Izzy. And think I've been to the last church I came to in 1996, and I just didn't want to talk. I'm thankful that our church is still faithful with all these young people and all these babies. I am Pastor, we talk to shepherds. We got the best shepherds, and I think we're the pastors too, by the way. <laughs> but anyway. And uh, another thing is I never want to talk to them about the Lord. I never did when Pastor, I mean, Pastor Pat uh, died. And I felt that I talked to them. And, but anyway, our church, I see it growing spiritually. Not very much. Not so much like you, Rhonda, but it's just me. But our church is growing spiritually. And another thing, our Thank you so much. I'll tell you, we have got such a good time. I, it's just it's just been a blessing to see the steps that we're taking. We're growing and we're growing. <laughs> we love you. Anybody else? Rita? I just wanted to give everyone a word of encouragement. You know, I've been praying and studying and reading the word and uh, there's a lot of warfare going on, you know, in our lives individually and this country and in the world. And what I've been studying and listening and learning, I've, the solution to that, the way to fight that is to speak God's word. Speak it out loud. When you read it, speak it out loud. Read it out loud. That's our greatest weapon. And that's what, how God wants us to fight against the, you know, warfare and the evil in the world. That's the, that's the solution. So I, I just encourage you to uh, start speaking the word. You know, you don't have to memorize it just because I'm bad with memory. Just open it up and just read it out loud and declare it, claim it, you know, call it down. So I've been trying to do more of that. So I'm just encouraging the rest of you to maybe try that too. I have another hand. Is that? Oh, Mikey P. That's his rap name that I gave him. Nobody else calls him that. Mikey P. Um, you had the slide up there. I forget exactly what it was, but basically it was something regarding God will always have somebody there to find you. You know, and I. God's definitely done that so many times in my life, and I know there's many times because I've seen him use gentlemen, you know, kids in that situation. But um, just been really blown away as of late, you know, with, with my kids and uh, the youth and the young adults, just uh, how God has always provided so many different people besides my wife and I to pour into I mean, our, our kids, our kids would probably be enough if it was just young enough. 
Um, you know, we all have our times, and there's other parents in this church. There's other young adults and youth in this church, and, and God just continues to bring more people in. Like Cassidy, you know, at a time when Jen and I needed, you know, to step away from young adult ministry and, and bring into Pretoria again. And, and so anyway, just, um, you know, with so many of the kids of this church in the mission field this summer, and even just, it, it blows my mind that David and Rachel was on this trip. And I mean, I was so excited when we heard that they were going of, you know, them ministering together as adults, you know, instead of David and Rachel ministering to adults. So, you know, I, I truly do believe that, you know, God will definitely put people in your path. And that's something we should always pray for if we're struggling, and it's something we need to be in an attitude of prayer, constantly looking to see where God can use us to, to plant that seed and come along and be an encourager, um, to be a, uh, I don't know what's going to be an accountability partner. Um, we need that, and we can be that. Um, you know, I've been going through a lot of tough times with health and this and that and long hours at work, and, you know, um, feeling alone a lot the past, honestly, the several years, but just here recently there's been an outpouring of, of guys and reaching out to me and rekindling um, friendships that, you know, Jen and I have kind of let go and just been busy with and excited about our vacation this year. And, you know, it's just been um, very encouraging. I want to keep it with the pumpries here for a little bit. Yeah, ditto on what he said, but I felt like God was leading me to share this this morning. Um, a couple months ago, Mike encouraged me to go away for a weekend by myself. <laughs> Ladies, go do that. <laughs> and guys. Um, but we can't always have that weekend away, but um, we can't always just step away from our duties and everything, and I'm trying to figure this out in the middle of a new season of life and busyness right now, so I don't have this down, but God just really respoke to me, Psalm 23, um, in a fresh and new way. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And this was my prayer to him that weekend. Lord, I was so dry. I wanted this weekend so badly, yet I had to be made go away to set this time aside for you. You have made me to come, and I am so thankful for rest, for renewal, for beauty, for your presence, for your voice, for a fresh infilling. You have restored my soul this weekend. I drew away, and you met me. You have led me all my life in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. I love you, Lord. I just wanted to encourage you to Mike and I are reading through Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, and know some of you guys are. And, um, but just, I'm trying to figure it out, but we have to have that time set aside, and he will restore our souls. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of like, share kind of what brought us here and how God's never, never given up on us. Um, we've, we've known Jesus, I would say, our whole lives as far as back as we can remember, stepping into a Christian school, a Catholic school, dealing, and um, I was raised in church, and for me, there's been so many times that I tried to <laughs> push God away and live a life that just made it, just making excuses or why this is okay, or what I was doing really wasn't that bad. Um, but basically, uh, six years ago, probably about this time of year, Lucy was, our oldest, was getting ready to start uh, daycare. And um, we were going to a place in Morgantown, and we, we showed up there like a week before, a weekend, to be prepared. And um, it was just like Steph 
step. It was just like, this is not the right play. So we were driving home, and uh, saw the Rock Daycare, Rock Family Church, there on uh, South Pier Park Road. Had just started their daycare. And we stopped in, and Lydia Shriver uh, was there. And it was just like this sense of relief. They, we had everywhere, every other daycare was waiting there. Nothing felt right. And we stopped there, and then it was just like a, a huge burden lifted. And so then she had one, yeah, for, for our baby. Yeah, so we, I mean, right then it was just a major blessing. But we had still resisted, um, and Lucy did not. Lucy does, has not. And uh, so then we were getting ready for. Lucy to start um, kindergarten, and it was kind of a surprise the way the timing worked. She couldn't stay at daycare. And uh, and so, well, in the meantime, we were looking for a new church, and uh, Lydia pointed us here. So then with the, when we got to kindergarten phase, pre preschool phase, <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, so Pastor Sean had texted uh, Steph just to check in, because I think that's when we had went to church here for a little bit, and then hadn't been here, and we had just had Cecilia, the second one. Um, and so she, had, Steph got a hold of Mrs. Whiteman, and there was one spot left, K-4, and then COVID and stuff, another excuse not to, you know, be in church and doing what you're supposed to do. And Lucy, again, Daddy, you got to go to church. We need to go to church. I want to go to church. And, you know, after being, coming here, picking her up, I mean, it's just such a, it's, it really worked on us. And uh, so we made it back and still coming to church, singing. Raising, but what really made a, something changed here in the past just few months. I started this job in Pittsburgh. It's only pretty much like a year or so. So I've had a lot of drive time. So I got sick of listening to the same songs and listening to the same news. And I found this podcast, Mission Men Focus for Christ. And it's like starting to like, like really work on me show me, like, <laughs> really overwhelming, because it's like, man, you got a lot of work to do. But, so then, I, like, listen to all those podcasts, because it's weekly, like a half an hour once a week. And so I reached out, and finally had the courage to start talking and asking for help a little bit more. And so, like, so many people gave me, like, advice and suggestions, and then now it's just like, I can't get enough, and it's just been so hungry for the word, and it's it's drive time, so it's a little bit chaotic, but it's just all day, and I just think it's been helping our family. It's just such a, and now at the end point of this long story is I finally discovered that I've always known Jesus, but we're finally trying to walk in his footsteps to follow Jesus, and I never knew the difference until the last few months, so God never gave up on us for so many we just need your guys' help and encouragement to, to keep giving us. I wanted to tell you, one of the things that we're doing um, is we're shifting this service back 15 minutes. Instead of 1030, it'll be 1045, and the early, earlier service will be 845 instead of 9. And we're going to offer life groups for everybody. And the reason for that, that window in between, is for community fellowship, accountability, all these stuff, because it is hard. We all have busy schedules. It's hard to make time. So if we put it in the middle of our Sunday when you're planning on being here anyway, it gives you a chance to connect, and from that you can grow. Well, before we go to worship, um, I want to share a quick testimony. Um, my little guy, Jaden. Uh, <clears throat> so kids are home for summer. Jaden's been stuck on me like glue since he was born. And... Uh, 
I, I was going out, picking stuff up, running errands, coming to the office, all the different things. And just this last week, I was putting on my shoes to work outside, and uh, he, was, he was with me, and he grabbed my face like this. And he said, Daddy, he said it just like this, don't leave me. Out of the mouth of babes. I can be just as guilty as anyone being busy providing, doing all the things that we're supposed to be doing. But my two year old says, Me, I need my daddy. Don't leave me. And just yesterday, I had to run out to the store. He's like, I'm coming. <laughs> I want to go, daddy. But I think the opposite is true, that Jesus, our Father, wants to grab us by the face and say, don't leave me. That's the difference. Harmon's exactly right. There's a difference between knowing Jesus and walking with Jesus. That's where we need to be. So worship team, if you'll come forward. I encourage you guys at at our response time here. If you have a Jonathan or somebody that you know um, that you can be accountable with, that can walk the journey, and you want prayer, grab them and pray with them. If you don't have that, pray for God to bring someone. I'm a firm believer that God has for every local church all the giftings they need to accomplish His good work. The problem is we don't ask for it and we don't seek it. Right? Scripture says, Ask and you receive, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be open. And so that's what this response time is for. God, you've prompted my heart a certain way. Now show me what I'm to do. Lord, we, we ask at this time that uh, after we've heard these Jonathan testimonies and our hearts are uplifted, that we would respond the way you call us to, that we would move as you guide us, and that you would unify us and send us out. In your name we pray. Amen.